Chapter 1 Max's eyes snapped open, his mind racing to locate the source of the pain. He found it in his lower back. Millions of buzzing needles pierced his kidneys, delivering stab after stab with the unnatural force he'd been avoiding for decades. Bad as his kidneys felt, they were cozy compared to the splitting itch inside his head, an itch that intensified by the second. If he could have reached inside his skull, he'd have scratched himself brain dead by now. Then it dawned on him. My traded parts are buzzing. That means I'm outside Hollow Hills. Sure enough, he became aware of a humming motor. He lifted his sweaty head off the back seat and noticed the shadowy outline of a driver. Someone was driving him out of town. In his own Toyota, no less. His mouth turned chalky. Sweat dripped from his forehead. Shifting to wipe the moisture away, he found he couldn't move his hands, which he realized, with dismay, were tied behind his back. He tried to sit up, struggling against the fastened seatbelt that pinned him to the back seat. What's happening to me? The last thing he remembered was taking out the trash at the banquet hall. Then he called his daughter, Jen, to ask if she'd be visiting for Thanksgiving. She hadn't been in town for five years, not since his 70th birthday, but he could always hope. Now he simply hoped he'd survive this situation, whatever it turned out to be. He struggled to loosen the seatbelt with his bound hands. Stop that, the driver said, his tone worried. The car glided along the highway. Streetlights flickered through the windows as snow melted down the glass. The air inside became muggy, hard to breathe. Please don't do this, Mac shouted. He felt the car slow. The driver seemed nervous, hesitant. Please, I'm just an old man. Mac watched an exit sign for Dixon City flash beyond the windshield. That meant they were approaching the edge of the ten-mile zone. I have a wife, a daughter, grandkid. Ah! The buzz in his back sharpened to a burn. Listen, he said, panting. My kidneys, they... I know about your kidneys, now shut it. The driver knew. Dear God. Chances were the driver wanted Mac's kidneys for himself. The creek demon back in Hollow Hills worked like a librarian. It could lend out only one of each body part. Mac had already borrowed both kidneys and the hippocampus, his brain's short-term memory bank. He would keep the organs until one of two things happened. Either he died or left the zone. The latter looked more inevitable by the second. He had to stop this. Call 911. His shoulder protesting, he angled his bound hands toward his front pocket and pinched his flip phone with two fingers. He grasped it. Although he couldn't see the numbers, he knew that pressing the call button would redial his last call, would redial Jen. He thumbed the button twice, heard a faint dial tone. Come on, come on. A pothole rattled the car and shook the phone from his fingers. No. It fell behind him. As he jerked against his restraints, his kidneys flared like hot steel in his lower back. He growled through his teeth. Static hissed behind him as his ringtone thrummed to life, playing break on through by the doors. The classic bass line kicked in, and before long, Jim Morrison was howling about day and night and breaking on through. It seemed Jen had gotten his call. Now he just needed to answer hers. Don't move, the driver said. Don't answer that phone. Mac strained, reaching for Morrison's voice. His finger grazed the plastic phone. He almost had a grip when the car swerved. The phone slid across the back seat, clattering against the door and thudded onto the floor mat. Out of reach. No, please no. Mac thought about the past twenty years and what little he'd done with them. he traded his kidneys so he could quit dialysis and enjoy life. Instead, he became hostage to the town while his family had left him behind. More recently, when Alzheimer's had set in, he traded his hippocampus to keep from forgetting them. Heat rolled through his brain now, as though flaming coals had been dumped down his ear canal. Already the memories were vanishing. He tried to recall his 70th birthday, but it left him like smoke through an open window. Desperately, he clawed after visions of his birthday. He remembered the picnic table where they'd served his red velvet birthday cake, remembered his wife, his daughter, and the plastic forks they'd teasingly poked into his sides. Remembered the laughter in his ears, the smell of their herbal shampoos, the smiles on their faces. He had them. Then, 
he began to lose them. Their faces blurred, then faded. But he still had Jen. He remembered hugging her before she left, remembered... Jen! Her smile returned, teeth and dimples in the face around them. He held on tight, trying to picture the rest of her. Her hair reappeared, a dark brown ponytail. It smelled of... nothing. The ponytail blurred, then her eyes, then her smile. Lost. No more Jen. The motor roared, speeding him toward the zone's edge. Heat engulfed his kidneys, then his brain. Flames torched his mind like a scrapbook in a bonfire, incinerating the memories, the moments, the meaning. He lost it all as he broke on through to the other side. Chapter Two Ash hurried inside with her guitar and some bad news. Tonight, the Dark Diamond pub throbbed with noise, pounding drums, wailing guitar solos, screeching static. Under normal circumstances, she'd have been amped for this. Few things in life got her going like a battle of the bands, especially one with prize money at stake. But tonight was different. Tonight she needed to find her bandmates and warn them. The green room was packed. Dozens of rocker dudes had stunk up the place with their unwashed armpits and cheap weed. Through the smoky haze, she saw nothing but silhouettes. Dark hair, dark clothes, dark instruments. Smartphones flashed, lighting some scruffy, sweaty faces. Most were hacks and has-beens, guys who shouted and laughed, boozed and snorted. Toward the middle of the pack, she spotted a spark of orange hair. Cheeto, her lead singer. Hugging her guitar to her chest, she shoved through the crowd, shouting his name. No answer. Her heart thumped like a double bass. Sweat greased her forehead. The room was too hot, and Ash unzipped her faux leather jacket as she barreled ahead toward the stage door. Cheeto! she yelled, twisting around. Anybody seen him? The lead singer from Bad Parts? Nobody answered. Most kept on drinking. A drummer with blue nose rings smirked as he leaned back to check out her 30-year-old ass. How flattering. Anybody seen Cheeto? She tugged sleeves and pulled hair to get people's attention. Scrawny guy, frizzy orange hair, almost as many tattoos as me. Ashes! Cheeto howled right behind her. Before she could brace herself, two tattooed arms swung around her torso and squeezed till her bones rumbled. Cheeto's okay. Thank fuck. Almost showtime, he said, shaking her by the shoulders. Ready to rip the roof off this place? Where's everybody else? Backstage, yo, you'll love this. He twisted her around, his green eyes smiled. These two college kids stopped me at the bar earlier. Get this, they were wearing our t-shirts, the ones I designed with our logo across the chest. I was going nuts. You still are, she shrugged free. Listen, those dudes want selfies with us. Let's invite them to... Ash slapped her hand over his mouth. Cheeto could yap for hours about beer being wet if you let him. Flanagan can't play tonight she said. That Irish drip? Cheeto grinned. He black out again. For once, no. She dragged him to a less crowded spot, away from the noise. Someone beat his face in, fractured the fuck out of his eye socket. I just got back from the ER. What? Beneath his orange hair, Cheeto's face faded as pale as paper. Why didn't you text me? My phone's dead. She narrowed her eyes. You know, because someone's been hogging my portable charger, he groaned. Flanny, shit. His scrawny fingers trembled as he reached into his camo vest for his smokes. He lit one and grimaced as he took a drag. What happened? No clue. I went to get my guitar from the van and found him passed out under the muffler. She cringed at the memory of Flanagan's wrecked face. It looked brutal. Who the hell did this? She shrugged. Flanny said he got jumped. Oh, man. Cheeto slumped against the wall. Remember those death threats we got last month from those psychos? That was in Maryland. A chill ran through her, but she shook it off. I mean, we're in Pennsylvania now. They could have followed us. Cheats. Or, wait, we're close to your hometown, right? Yeah. Only about 15 minutes from the suburban shithole that was Hollow Hills. Too close. Any old grudges? 
Tons, but none that would earn Flanny a beatdown. He frowned. The thing is, she said, we're the favorites to win tonight and take the prize money. Chances are someone KO'd Flanny to sabotage us. He took a drag, exhaled. Shit. Yeah. After a deep breath, she looked toward the stage door. Anyway, you're on rhythm tonight. What? Cheeto's eyes popped. You're not canceling? We don't cancel. She strapped her guitar over her shoulder. That's not us. But Flanny's in the ER. We should be there. He met her eyes. Aw, oh, come on, Ash. Grow a heart. Flanny insisted we do the show. You know him. He's no quitter. Plus, he needs the money. No. Cheeto's fingers shook hard as he almost dropped his cig. Fuck this. What's wrong? Afraid of double duty? His face burned red. It's not that. The hell it isn't. Relax. You'll kick ass on rhythm. She cupped his face in her hands, brushed her thumbs over his scruff. His trembling slowed. She smiled. Focus on the chords. Your singing will handle itself. Trust me. Pulling back, Cheeto dragged his cig till his cheeks hollowed. Behind him, the stage door opened, and a bunch of talentless hacks in Viking helmets stumbled off stage. Bad parts, the stage manager yelled. You're up. He closed the door without waiting for them. Cheeto stomped out his cig. This is a bad, bad idea. Halfway into their opening song, the show turned rough. In the middle of the cramped, dark venue, a mosh pit stirred to life, led by a bandana-headed dude who rushed, shoved, and tackled until he jacked up the pit's intensity to 11. Just the way Ash liked it. On stage, she played her guitar with a pounding pulse. Sweat slicked her face as she strummed faster and rocked harder. She swung her white girl dreads in a hurricane frenzy, the speakers thundering behind her. Partway through the set, she spotted two Bad Parts t-shirts down in front, right against the stage barrier. They were the two fans Cheeto mentioned. They screamed lyrics and hammered their heads in sync with her main riff. She stepped toward them in time for a finger-splitting solo, her hand scampering down the fretboard like a methed-up spider. Both guys went nuclear, pumping their fists in salute. Behind them, the mosh pit spiraled outward, squishing the front rows into the stage barrier. Dozens hunched over the railing, faces hanging down. The stagehands didn't arrive to help. They were preoccupied with crowd surfers at the other end. Ash signaled for Kane, her drummer, to dial back the pace. For a moment, the crowd settled. Then, Cheeto found his groove. He howled through the opening verse of their hyper-fast song, Slave to the Sound, and sent the place into hysterics. The pit turned nasty, but Ash couldn't afford to stop. Not now. Not with Cheeto rocking and the judges noticing. Besides, the crowd craved more. At this rate, they'd all tweet and Instagram about how bad parts had thrashed the place for 15 relentless minutes. She tore into the song's final solo, fingers burning down the strings. Ash noticed the pair of fans up front gagging as the barrier rail dented against their chests. Both faces burned red. For a moment, she made eye contact with one. Then his eyes clenched shut in pain. Something broke inside her. They were her fans, and nobody fucked with her fans. She needed them like oxygen on the moon. She nixed the solo and grabbed the mic off Cheeto. He raised his brow in question, but stepped aside. All you fuckers, back it up, she called, still strumming. People up here are getting squashed. The pit raged on, led by that bandana-headed asshole. Back it up! The crowd ignored her especially the swirling mess in the middle. Last warning, she said. Back off or I walk. It was a threat she couldn't afford to fall through on. Killing the show now would disqualify them and forfeit an easy payday. She looked at Cheeto, his rhythm locked in, looked past the drum set at Kane, who kept bashing away, looked across the stage at Remy, their bassist, whose face was transfixed, like he'd swallowed a whole bag of shrooms and seen Zeus. The band caught fire. Ash was certain they were going to win this. For the money, for themselves, for Flanny. But not for her fans. Their mouths hung open, sucking for air, right in front of her. The sight turned her stomach into a ball of ice, yet she kept strumming. 
if those kids could just hang on, just one more song, just... The pair wilted over the railing. Ash couldn't bear it another second. She unplugged her guitar. The music turned hollow without her. Cheeto glanced over, his brow furrowed with confusion. The others stared with mixed expressions of disgust and disbelief. The music stopped. The crowd booed. Cursing herself out, Ash marched off stage. Chapter 3 Ash loaded the van in silence. It sat under a shaky floodlight toward the back of the parking lot. The inside stank of cut-rate Chinese takeout. Nobody's favorite, but they had to make do. Earlier, she promised her bandmates if they won the competition, they could splurge at a steakhouse. That was, of course, before she abruptly ended the show. What a shithead move. Sure, she saved two fans from getting crushed, but now she was packing up gear instead of wrecking eardrums in the final round of the competition. Once her Gibson was securely stowed, she stepped aside. Nobody acknowledged her. Remy tossed his bass inside. Kane stashed his rock and roller cart, drum cases, and hardware bag. The two of them announced they were going to meet up with some chicks they met earlier. When Cheeto reminded them that Flanny was still hospitalized, they said they'd visit him later. Much later. Cheeto went ballistic. Soon, the three of them were shoving and trading insults. Ash, her mind still on the show, didn't bother intervening. Losing easy money was bad, but walking out on a crowd was pure sin. She took her frustrations out on their gear cases, playing a rough game of luggage Tetris until all of it was stashed. By then, Remy and Kane had disappeared into the gloom. Raindrops began to patter against the van roof. Cheeto sat on the tailgate and lit a smoke. He grinned, eyeing her up and down. Yo ashes. She slammed the opposite door shut. What? That was kind of cool what you did. Kind of stupid, you mean? No way, he tapped his cig. I didn't notice people were getting squeezed. Good thing you stopped it. Yeah, couldn't let our fans get hurt. I mean, what good am I without them? Crazy good, he grinned. She rolled her eyes. What? I'm serious. I wish the music biz would get serious. They will, he said. Don't forget about our Friday gig. That's our coming out party. Her mind tingled at the thought. They were opening for Death Grip, an underrated 80s thrash group that made Slayer look slow. When Death Grip announced their farewell tour, Ash emailed them and somehow earned an opening slot at their Fort Lauderdale gig the very last show in the band's history. Thousands would be in attendance, even some bigwigs from major labels. We're gonna rock that stage to rubble, she said. Hell yeah. Buddy of mine at the venue said they already sold 6,000 tickets. Monster gig for us. About time, she said, clenching her fists. I'm sick of playing these cramped little shithouses. I'm too good for it. Relax, you'll be the queen of metal someday. Someday? Try Friday. Goosebumps rushed across her neck in anticipation. I'll yank that throne from any bitch ballsy enough to sit on it. Save me a seat on the armrest, my lady. He stood and delivered a sweeping bow. Ash snorted. You can lie on the floor. Be my footrest. They laughed. He flung his cig into a puddle. All right, ready to go visit Flanny? You go. Just me? Yep. She reached behind him and grabbed a stack of demo CDs. Tonight's show may have bombed, but it wasn't too late to recruit new fans over by the bar. Pick me up in an hour. You can't be serious. Sure can, she said. Besides, I already saw Flanny. Remember? I'm the one who drove him to the ER. Oh, come on, Ash. Don't leave him hanging. She shouldered past him, ignoring his chiding remarks. The drizzle picked up, drowning out Cheeto's voice and splashing her with November chills. She hurried, cutting between parked cars, until she heard someone approach on her left. Without street lamps, she saw only darkness in that direction. Then a silhouette emerged, tall and boxy-shouldered, like one of the pub's bouncers. She assumed he was just that, though his head twitched in an odd, spazzy way, it reminded her of someone headbanging, but there was no rhythm to it. There was, however, rhythm to his legs. Puddles splashed beneath him as he rushed closer. Rushed straight for her. 
Her spine turned to ice. Another moment passed before Ash noticed he was wearing a ski mask. That settled it. Clearly this guy wasn't coming over for a selfie with her. The man started running. So did she. Cheeto! She shouted. Ahead of her, the van's taillights flickered as he backed out of the parking spot. Cheeto, wait! The brakes gave an aching squeal. Behind her, footfalls splashed closer. She sprinted for the passenger side and dropped the CDs as she tore open the door. With shuddering relief, Ash threw herself inside. I knew it, Cheeto said with a triumphant fist pump. Knew you wouldn't leave Flanny hanging. Shut up, there's a psycho out there. What? Somebody chased me. Breathing heavy, she checked the side mirror. All she saw was darkness and the orange dots of distant street lamps. The guy, his, his head was twitching like he was possessed or some shit. For real? He squeezed her shoulder. You okay? Just get us out of here.